Hey y'all, Jonathan here. I'm presenting on my book report for Senior Science and Faith Seminar. Now, I had a wonderful book. My book is called Great Mambo Chicken and the Transhuman Condition, Science Slightly Over the Edge by Ed Regis. And as soon as I picked up this book in the library back, you know, when uh, Life on Campus was a thing, I knew that I was in for a treat. I opened up to the chapters page. I just wanted to share some of these with you that I really got a kick out of. Um, home on Lagrange, uh, on Lagrange, pardon. Um, <laughs> Omnipotence, Plenitude, and Company. Um, La c'est le bon ton collé. Hence for the better operation of the universe. Uh, Regis wrote this book in a very wry, uh, joking kind of way. Totally had fun uh, with it. So it was science oriented. Um, we're tracking the ideas of transhumanists from about uh, the 1960s through to 1990 uh, when the book was published. So. He wrote the book in an odd way. He basically tracked um, from story, person, 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 um, their stories, some of the background, and then the ideas that they supported um, that led to transhumanist kind of tendencies. I would like to start um, with the idea of the omega point. Now, this is kind of the grounding for the whole book. Um, it's an idea that was come up by John Barrow and Frank Tipler in 1986. Um, but it, it's the it's the desire behind pretty much all transhuman thought. So here's here's how they described it. At the instant the omega point is reached, life will have gained control of all matter and forces, not only in a single universe, but in all universes whose existence is logically possible. Life will have spread into all spatial regions in all universes which could logically exist and will have stored an infinite amount of information, including all bits of knowledge which it is logically possible to know. So with all those alls <clears throat> and like universes and stuff, essentially the idea is that we as humanity, or as who we are, maybe having dropped our humanity, um, should know everything and have power over everything, right? So that we can make the world and the universe what it really should be. Um, and that is kind of the core of all of this. But um, as important people go, we're gonna start with uh, Jerry O'Neill or Gary O'Neill. Uh, this guy was a physics professor at Princeton. He almost became an astronaut. He was very close. He actually made the last draft. Um, always was fascinated with space. But essentially, he determined that uh, planets, especially Earth, was like a terrible place to live. Now, there were several reasons for this. Um, for one, spheres have the least amount of surface area per unit mass. Uh, so he was interested in like agriculture and stuff. Uh, plus, the day-night cycle messes up plants because if they just had you know endless sunlight, they'd be better and so all this stuff but mostly he had a problem with the mass so all that mass down in the earth that we couldn't access was also causing like gravity and volcanoes and earthquakes so he said you know we need to get rid of this naturally divide uh, naturally provided habitat what we need are these space utopias that we design where we can get rid of all the flaws that come with this pesky nature stuff and you know live without any bad weather um, in space and so he gave lots and lots of talks on this um, but one of the most important things he did for the context of this book is he inspired the Hensons now Keith and Carolyn Henson uh, were great movers of people okay they didn't have too many uh, ideas of their own but they really got a lot of people together they founded what's called the L5 Society and L5 is a reference to the Lagrange regions um, I hope I'm saying that correctly you can ask uh, the physics people what exactly they are the idea that i got was they're essentially like gravitational equilibrium points between the earth and the moon that's where o'neill wanted to put all of his um space colonies kind of to anchor them but they so they started l5 l5 was like a think tank for people that wanted to do more with uh, life than just be on earth and be humanity so it pulled a lot of people together um they started planning what they called the far edge party and the far edge party has direct ties to the omega point the idea is that at some point you'll either have like copied yourself so that you can see more stuff or um, but anyway you'll go to the end of the universe okay and humanity will spread across all the existence and so the idea of the far edge party is once we've seen everything done everything we're just gonna have this huge party to like get together and enjoy it and put all of our different memories back into like one of us because we've copied ourselves and all this stuff um, so anyway, they did a lot of a lot of people grouping. Um, one of the people that they worked for, actually, Keith Henson worked for this guy, Bob Ettinger. Um, Ettinger really worked with the ideas. He wrote a couple books, all this stuff. So background on Ettinger. He, he was a second lieutenant in World War II, got wounded in Germany, and spent several years in the hospital. So this guy really did some deep thinking on uh, mortality and pain. He essentially decided that being human was terrible uh, because, you know, we have pain and we die, and those are bad things. So he wrote a book called The Prospect of Immortality. 
1964, and he actually started the cryonics movement. He worked with a group called uh, the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, which is where Keith Henson worked, and they were the cryonicists. Okay? They wanted to <laughs> cut people's heads off and dip them in liquid nitrogen so that they could be revived, um, however far in advance our technology would take, to get people back from that state. And um, so anyway, Ettinger started all this stuff. He also, um, he, so it took him a while, but in uh, 1972, he wrote another book called Man into Superman. And in this book, he really laid out um, his thesis for why being human uh, was terrible and why we should go on from there. So here are some quotes uh, from him that really helped to push um, ideas in transhumanistic uh, directions. So he said, to be born human is an affliction. It shouldn't happen to a dog. Okay, another quote by him, it's hard to imagine that human engineers could be any clumsier or messier than that old slattern Dame Nature. The normal process of evolution, the processes, pardon, of evolution are wasteful and cruel in stupefying degree. So the idea here, and this was very, very important, is that evolution, unguided by anything at all, nature, the powers of nature, our physics, all this stuff, okay, it actually made a mess with making us. It really messed up. So it, I mean, it it did a good job, okay, we're here, but now we're gonna take over and we're gonna make the world into what we really want, into what's really good as we decide. So that was the that was the essence of uh, the basically the whole book, is we need to take um, all this godless, unhelpful, undirected, unintelligent stuff that we were given, and we can do something better with it. Um, that's where Moravec really, really shines. So this next guy, Hans Moravec, he was a Carnegie Mellon roboticist. Okay, he came up with the idea of downloading. So this guy really thought that being human was terrible. He agreed with that. We're wretched. Okay, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Well, I'll tell you. Hans Moravec will. Hans Moravec wants to make you into a robot. Okay, so Moravec worked a lot, a lot with robots, and he came up with downloading. He actually came up with four different ways that downloading could actually work. Most people would come up with theory, but not more of it. He had some incredible ideas. Okay, idea number one, how to put yourself into a computer. Okay, one, incredibly advanced robot brain surgeon designed to program <laughs> during the surgery is going to take each cell of your brain in layers, learn it, all the inputs, the outputs, okay, copy it into a machine software, and then delete it. So as it dissects you layer upon layer all the way down 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 you're going to die but it's going to get all the information from each of your cells and be able to recreate you as a program okay that was way one if you didn't really like that idea step or way two okay sever the corpus callosum now the corpus callosum is the major um, communication between the right and the left hemispheres so he said if you cut this and then connect both ends to a computer and then think about something for a while do something i don't know teach the robot as you're communicating back and forth between the hemispheres what it is like to think as you then the robot can put you in a um, a program and make you by learning between the corpus callosum okay type three way three tag yourself with a robot sensor your entire life that measures your brain waves now you teach it all of your thoughts for however long it takes, and eventually it's going to be able to extrapolate you out, okay? But that's not enough. Way number four, instantly brain scan everything in your body, okay? So brain, but also body. All of the information from everywhere in your body, and without an invasive procedure, this is only if we get really good technology, okay? So without the brain surgeon coming in and killing you, this is a way of essentially doing the same thing. All the same information and being able to just scan you and bloop, put you in a computer. So you lose the terrible body. That was the main goal. Morvik did not like being human. He wanted more capacities. But how do you make sure that you actually have everything from you? Like, is the body actually inherent to you? Well, that's a very interesting question. Morvik was married to a Christian. Okay, this lady was going through seminary. And what he said um, from some conversations with her, here's a quote about essence and why he didn't think that essence would be a problem if you got rid of your body. Okay, here's what he said. The idea that your essence is software seems a very small step from the idea that your essence is spirit. Okay, so he was familiar with the Christian thought processes. He said, you know, if you're actually just a spirit, then losing your body really shouldn't hurt you that much. Your personality would be intact, your ideas would be intact, and everything that makes you is actually going to be better with the computer to express it through. Okay, so that's a very, uh, <laughs> very interesting claim. Um, one other person, though, I've got to talk about, Eric Drexler. Drexler um, got a master's thesis in, or he he made his he wrote his master's thesis on solar sailing. 
But he was really the guy to get all of this out of the theory and into practical working stuff. This guy designed, he came up with the idea of nanotechnology, okay, theoretically at least. He wrote a book called Engines of Creation in which he laid out the idea that nanotechnology is where we will have control of robots smaller than cells, maybe even at the level of molecules, which will be able to intimately control each and every molecule in existence. So if you can control every molecule and things at an atomic level, then you can make, as you can synthesize, anything you want to out of pretty much anything. You just need the atomic elements. So he said, with this nanotechnology, with these assemblers is what he called them, we will have ultimate power over everything, right? And this is what we needed, because if you're going to put yourself in a computer, you might die. And if you're going to freeze yourself in nitrogen, you might die. All these ideas are great, but with Drexler's assemblers, they're actually possible. So he said, this is how we're going to actually do it. And lots of people were concerned, and they said, you know, what if these things get out of control? all this other stuff, you could wreck the world, you know, if you had this little thing that was supposed to make meat and it got out and made a forest into meat, like that's a problem. He said, well, you know, that could be a problem, but here's a quote by him about what we should do about the, the idea of the problem with assemblers. He said, you know, I had a problem with this, but quote, later I learned that abuse was the real issue and that accidents were so easily avoided that they were a very secondary concern. So interestingly enough, Drexler actually put the blame back on us again. He said abuse is the problem. And this is the core response from all transhumanisms, or all, all transhumanistic ideas, okay? You might think that this is wrong. You might think it violates human nature, but ultimately the only problem is an abuse. It's back on you. But the interesting thing is that we get to define abuse. So as long as we think that it's good, it's good. And we have ultimate power, so who's to say otherwise? Who's to say otherwise? Um, real quick to conclude, this is um, what Mr. Regis thought about um, how they saw themselves, and it's a very interesting question. Um, he said, none of our extremely advanced thinkers ever saw themselves as tragic heroes, and why should they? In their own eyes, at least, all they were doing was using science in the ordinary way to gain control over nature and improve the lot of humanity just as their predecessors had done. That's how he concludes. So if we're just doing what people had come and done before us and we're doing it more effectively, we're making life a better place, who's to say that we're wrong for doing it? And that is a very interesting question. So I would encourage you to um, look to morality for answers about you know what you should be doing with your ultimate power. Um, but it was a really great book. If you wanted to read it, I encourage you to. Um, I think that ultimately, if you take God out of the equation, you don't have his standards, um, then their logic is actually quite coherent. Um, we should make the world a better place and we should have all power to do it. But ultimately, God is the one who should have all power and it's his morals and his standards that we should live for. And as long as we're under that um, umbrella, I think we should improve a lot of humanity. I'm okay with uh, looking into science. Obviously, that's what my degree is in. So I encourage you to think about this, read a book. I mean, great mambo chicken. It's great. Um, Y'all have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you later.